Thank you for tuning into this collaborative networking blog. My name is Anna Pease. I am an APCRC Launching Fellow. I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes talking about my plans for the APCRC Launching Fellowship, which is going to be working towards developing a primary care intervention for improving infant safety and well-being. My background is in working to prevent cot death or SIDS and we have seen an 80% fall in these deaths due to the preventative advice that's been given to families over the last 25 years. The difficulty now is in reaching those residual deaths that mainly come from poorer families. So I hope that what I propose will um, work to contribute to reduce those deaths further, save the NHS money and bring a more unified approach to primary care contact with young families. Here's what I'm going to cover briefly. I'll talk about a little bit of background to the SID story in the UK. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the work that I did for my PhD, which was looking at decision making. Uh, I'll briefly mention the OASIS study, which is a, a project that we have ongoing at the moment. And then finally, I'll end with my specific plans for how I'm going to spend my time on the APCRC fellowship. So here at the graph on the left hand side we can see the SIDS rates in the UK uh, from 1979 to 2015. You can see that around the late 80s SIDS was at a peak with over 1400 deaths in one year. Parental anxiety and fear at that time were high and it was not uncommon to know someone whose baby had died suddenly and unexpectedly in their sleep with no cause ever found. At that time the research looking into these deaths found three factors that were more common in babies that had died and those were being placed on the tummy for sleep, being wrapped in too many blankets and exposed to tobacco smoke. Those three factors then became the UK's Back to Sleep campaign, which was a national campaign um, with TV ads featuring Anne Diamond, whose son Sebastian had died as SIDS. The resulting fall in the numbers of babies dying is heralded as one of the biggest successes of public health epidemiology in the 20th century. In the years that have followed since that major campaign, we've not seen any further dramatic decreases, uh, but we have still seen a 65% decrease in SIDS since 1992. However, in 2015, as you can see from the graph on the right, over 200 babies died in England and Wales, and it's estimated that most of the babies that now die have at least one known risk factor present, and those deaths do persist at much higher rates in socioeconomically disadvantaged groups. The graph on the right shows the SIDS rates uh, more recently recently by mother's age, with the blue line at the bottom being the general population, mothers aged between 20 and 24 in orange with much higher rates and in higher still rates for mothers under 20. So the success of those national campaigns might have an un unearthed the inequality rather than created, but we now know that those campaigns have not been as successful for these groups and they now need targeted effective support to reduce these numbers further. My PhD focused on understanding why some families who are more at risk of SIDS don't follow the recommended advice and what might be done to support these families with increasing safety for their babies. It was a mixed methods study with a survey uh, looking at knowledge of SIDS risk for 400 mothers living in deprived areas of Bristol. And I also did home interviews with 20 mothers at higher risk about their own decision making for infant care. These mothers were predominantly un 25 or under, um, had smoked when they were pregnant, had three or more children and lived in a deprived part of Bristol. The interviews that I carried out with these mothers um, showed very clearly that um, it's not just as simple as ignoring or disregarding advice, but that there were complex reasons for why uh, parents chose to do the things that they did with their babies. And the analysis from these interviews found four major themes influencing their decision making. They used their previous experience to make decisions and judged the credibility of the advice that they were given. They talked about disrupted routines that led to risky scenarios with the belief that sometimes occasional risks were okay. And where circumstances made following the advice more difficult, they often found alternative strategies to reduce the risk that were not always effective, including the use of movement monitors, regular checking and a belief that lighter maternal sleep in the presence of a baby was protective. I'm going to present one quote from each of the four major themes. Uh, on the bottom line here, you can see that this was participant number nine. Uh, this mother was aged 33 and she had five children. The first theme is previous experience and mothers did value what they had done before with their older children or what others had done with their own children more highly than the evidence-based messages that they were given by health professionals. If they couldn't match up with what they were being told of in terms of risk then with what they'd seen in their own lives then they were less likely to believe and less likely to follow the advice as shown in this quote. 
The second theme described how mothers judged the credibility of the advice that they were given to reduce the risk of SIDS. And there was a definite feeling among the mothers that they felt as though they were just supposed to accept a list of do's and don'ts without question. And for some, this led to a mistrust of the advice and ultimately not following it, as we can see here. In the third theme, um, there was a belief from some of the mothers that a rare practice could be a safer practice, so just doing things every so often or occasionally was all right, and unfortunately we know from the observational studies in this area that this is sadly not the case. Finally, some mothers saw mon using monitors or frequent checking as a way of reducing the risk for SIDS, and there was some evidence um, that they mothers felt that monitors gave protection in a way that made following the safe sleep advice less important. So finally, understanding more about these decision-making processes means we can begin to devise interventions that make a difference to the underlying causes of risky sleep scenarios, and in doing so, hope to increase protection for babies. So you can see here some of the impact from the work that I did as part of the PhD. On the left is the um, Safer Sleep poster from the Lullaby Trust, which is the major SIDS risk reduction charity in the UK. And they do a Safer Sleep Week every March. And my the results from the interviews that I conducted helped to inform directly the design and content of uh, the 2017 Safer Sleep campaign. You can see on the right the kind of reach that they've got. Since completing the PhD, I have been working on the OASIS study, which is the Autoacoustic Signals Investigation Study, looking at potential for an association between the um, hearing screening recordings that all babies get in the UK and subsequent risk of sudden and unexpected deaths in infancy. It also has provided us with the opportunity con to conduct a national case control study looking at the epidemiology of SIDS as an update to the previous work done in this area. The reason for looking at um, autoacoustic emissions or the hearing screening records and the risk of SIDS came from a study that was carried out 10 years ago that found a reduced response from the hearing screening test in the right ear of 31 babies that had died as SIDS. And they concluded that this finding, if it was robust, could initiate the use of the newborn hearing screening test to identify which infants might be more at risk uh, from birth. So it was that study in particular that prompted the research questions behind the OASIS study. If it was shown to be possible, and we're still doing the analysis, um, then this risk factor could be taken along with other known demographic risk factors to identify quite a small proportion of the population for whom an intervention would be both impactful and cost effective. So now I'll move on and talk about uh, the, my future plans. I am just beginning the APCRC launching fellowship and a, a major part of that will be to um, improve my publications record and here are three of the future publications that I would hope to uh, submit and um, publish in, in the coming two years. The first one, the International SIDS classification, will be quite um, an important paper because that one looks at the rates um, across different countries and we can identify things such as diagnostic shift and different differential classification systems um, to get a good picture of how we're doing in the UK with regards to reducing the risks and reducing the numbers of babies that die. So here is my current concept for what an intervention might look like. Um, every intervention has to start with an idea and this is where I'm at at the moment. So on the left here you can see a couple of quotes from things that mothers have said, uh, said to us about um, being pressured into doing things or not having enough time to think about what they're going to do versus um, what professionals tell us which seems to agree with the mothers actually and that they don't have a lot of time. Sometimes there are things that have to take precedent and they're not always sure how impactful the conversations that they have are. And so at the moment the consideration is towards a package of support for professionals to engage in brief effective conversations about infant safe sleep and it would also be applicable to conversations about other infant care practices such as breastfeeding, weaning and child safety around the home. So that's the concept in its current form, but uh, it would be an iterative process um, and that would hopefully be refined and revised as we go along and I think it's important to get the methodology as good as it can be prior to submitting it for um, 
a trial. Um, the work here that you can see to co-produce the intervention um, would facilitate that refining and revision. And the first thing here would be to engage the networks that are needed to make this successful, including parents, health professionals early on. Um, the second thing would be to carry out a literature review of interventions to improve infant safety because we don't want to reinvent the wheel, we want to know what's out there and learn from them. Thirdly, we would develop the patient and public involvement groups, so formally with key stakeholders to support the development of the research and the intervention that would be both professionals and parents on those groups. Uh, next to conduct original qualitative interviews and focus groups with families and the health professionals that work with them to further understand their decision making and conversations about infant sleep, drawing on the success of our previous research, and finally to pilot the intervention with strong evaluation measures built in in order to, um, as I say, consolidate that methodology before going to a trial. So over the next two years, obviously that work to co-produce the intervention is one of the main tasks of the fellowship, um, but that's within an overall program of work that you can see here, um, which will include at attending relevant training in writing and strengthening my publications record, reinforcing the local, national, academic and international collaborations to support the work, and of course preparing and submitting a strong external fellowship application. So thank you very much for listening to this presentation. Um, here's my email address and I would love to hear from any of you um, if you have any questions or would like to get in touch about the work as we go forward. Thank you.